Good morning. This is Wendy Downing, pastor of the Steelville Presbyterian Church. And the sermon this morning is Dropping Our Nets from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Let us pray. Speak to us your word, O God, that we may hear Jesus' call to be his disciples. Amen. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Okay, let's be honest with each other and with ourselves. <clears throat> As we heard about the calling of Peter and Andrew, James and John, we're probably thinking to ourselves, wait a minute, this just doesn't seem like reality. This man comes along named Jesus, he speaks and people jump. They just leave everything and follow him. Either that's an exaggeration of what actually happened, or it's got to be some kind of divine intervention. Either way, it's not something I can relate to. Not in today's context anyway. There's no way I could just walk away from my current life on a moment's notice. I have family and church community and responsibilities. And with that kind of thinking, many of us dismiss this passage as ancient history with little or no application to our lives. But hold on a minute. There are probably a fair amount of interactive history between Jesus and these men before they made their decision to leave their homes and take up with him. In fact, Many New Testament scholars suggest that this was just the defining moment in what had been a longer process of Jesus pulling on their heartstrings. Clearly, they had met him sometime earlier and heard him teach and preach. The events of John 1 we talked about last week make this evident. Perhaps what we have here is not the sudden and impulsive decision of four fishermen nor the divine intervention of God, so much as the reasoned and deliberate choice of four individuals. These four, after a period of exposure to the compelling invitation of Jesus, chose to follow him, perhaps with divine intervention working on their hearts. Viewed in this light, the calling of the disciples and their faith-filled responses takes on new and more realistic perspective, one that we should carefully explore for its application to our lives. So let's think about it for a moment. For most of us, the call of Jesus on our lives, his summons to discipleship, comes only after we've sufficiently been exposed to Jesus' life and teachings to understand the truth residing in his person and in his words. Spontaneous spur of the moment following is not simply not the norm or the reality or the practical. But when that moment of truth or recognition comes, as it does in one way or another for most Christians, we then have to make a definitive decision. Leave our nets, leave our places where we've lived for 21 years and follow, or let the Lord walk away while we return to business as usual. Needless to say, Jesus and the entire witness of the New Testament declare that choosing the former is far wiser Peter and Andrew, James and John chose the wiser course, and the rest, as they say, is history. But let's go ahead and ask the difficult questions. What about you? Have you heard and responded to the call of Christ in your own life? Are you feeling drawn by the appealing truth of his presentation? If so, keep in mind that unlike these first disciples, following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that we have to leave our homes and our families in our professions. What it does mean, however, is that we must be willing to leave the nets, or rather the things that entangle and ensnare us, 
leave the nets of our old lifestyles, that is, the lifestyles of living for ourselves only, to enter the lifestyle of living for others. Ah, and let's be clear, that's the big one for us in this life. And once we do make the decision to fish for people, what can we expect? Many things, no doubt. And the New Testament is clear that we can expect trouble. Or to express it more nobly, we can expect a summons to sacrifice. Ouch. Now that's not something we want to hear. In fact, it sounds downright discouraging and even no fun. And yet, it's the truth. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote, when Christ calls a man or woman, he bids them come and die. Even though the first disciples may not have fully understood what they were in for at their initial moment of decision, Jesus soon made it abundantly clear that at the very least, they were in for quite a bumpy ride. Mother, when Mother Teresa was a young girl preparing to leave Yugoslavia to enter full-time Christian following, her mother told her to put her hand in the hand of Jesus and go wherever he led. She did, and it led her to the poorest section of India for more than 30 years. Sacrifice. Trouble. Here in America, to a large extent, we've lopped off the sacrificial aspect of following Christ and made the Christian life into something of a buddy-buddy relationship with Jesus, one that simply makes life for us easier. We have family, friends, people we can count on, people we can love. In effect, Jesus is our good luck amulet. We love him and we're devoted to the disciplines that keep us close to him. But when our Christ following is subjected to the light of authentic gospel witness, it immediately shows itself to be a half-baked distortion of the biblical record. No pain, just gain. In this sense, we ignore the cross of our Lord, along with his compelling words. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. One day in 1810, the father of Anne Hazeltine received a letter from a young man named Adoniram Judson, asking for permission to court his daughter so she could accompany him on his mission to India. It read like this. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure for a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of missionary life, to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? History records that his answer was yes and the subsequent lifestyle of trouble and sacrifice is now a matter of history. So where are we in this matter of choosing to follow? Is Jesus calling us to leave our nets and follow his lead? Are we tempted to go just as Peter, James, John, Andrew? If so, aren't we to let the price put us off? To a greater or lesser degree, it will mean sacrifice. But in the end, the eternal payoff will far outweigh any temporal cost. From the very lips of our Lord come these reassuring words. Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Let us not count the cost. Let us go. Let us leave our nets. Simply said, if we aren't already doing so, let us follow Jesus. It won't be easy, but we won't regret it, now or in eternity. Amen. Please stay tuned for a couple of announcements. Youth group will meet tonight from 5 to 6.30. The sign-up sheet is in the back of the sanctuary for snack suppers.
And we have uh, our congregational corporation meeting this morning, right after worship, to um, elect new elders who are going to uh, serve on the session for the next three years, the new nominations committee members, and approve my terms of call and accept the annual reports.